Eminent domain laws, or some form of them, have existed in the United States for a very long time. Arguments made for both sides of the issue were made as far back as the drafting of the Constitution. But how far can that go? And how far can eminent domain laws be taken? The Fifth Amendment of the Constitution states property taken for public use mandates a payment of just compensation to the owner. This brought me to the idea. What happens when one of your dearly departed family members or ancestors happen to be buried in land that a governing body says, this would be great for public use? Can the earthly remains of your ancestors be disturbed? Can someone arbitrarily say, hey, it's time to pack them up and move them? Seems a little extreme. As far as the answer to this question goes, I'm afraid there isn't one clear answer mainly being every time an eminent domain declaration has been challenged and has made its way to the Supreme Court, it is nearly always stated that states have the right to make their own determinations of public use. Like it or not, the ultimate declaration of what happens in this situation will be decided by the state in which you live. I live in Kentucky. Let me tell you a little story. Grayson Lake State Park is located near Grayson, Kentucky and spans across Carter and Elliott County. In total, it covers over 1,500 acres and provides outdoor entertainment for the droves of people who visit it yearly. You can boat, you can fish, you can even golf. I spent many hours of my youth here and even as an adult, I love to come here to hike and experience the natural outdoor beauty that Kentucky has to offer. I have wonderful memories of coming here with my grandfather, the fisherman in our family. We've been to birthday parties, picnics, family reunions, all at this park. It was even said that the Shawnee and Cherokee would make encampment in this area, in this small area of Kentucky. If there was ever a spot for public use, this would be it. And although the beautiful scenery is not man-made, the lake is. And with that, there had to be a lot of digging. There had to be a lot of relocation, both the living and the dead. And when bringing up this topic, I knew I had to tell this story. One particular family cemetery that was affected was the Blevins Family Cemetery located in Birchfield. I tried to locate Birchfield on the map. Good luck, it's underwater. Somewhere around 40 family cemeteries were in this area in the 1960s, the decade in which the project began. And although this is considered a state park, the project was completed by the Army Corps of Engineers, which would be federal, not state. When it was decided that the plan was to move forward with the building of the lake, families were visited and advised that their respective cemeteries would be included in the move. They were offered free graves at the relocation cemetery that they chose and any living relatives that intended on being buried in that cemetery were provided free grave plots too. Not only that, homes and farms along with the deceased were relocated. Can you imagine all of those impacted and how they felt? If someone told you that you were losing your home, your farm, your livelihood, how would you feel? I'm certain they felt the same way. And I'm sure that the idea from the government side of things is that, yeah, you may be mad now, but 100 years from now, nobody will remember and this state park will still be serving the area. Mixed emotions on both sides of the aisle. The East Carter Memory Gardens were founded as a relocation cemetery for the Grayson Lake Project. I'm taking you all to that cemetery now and going to show you a few final resting places from the Blevin Cemetery that were located in the now underwater Birchfield, Kentucky. Now we've made our way to East Carter Memory Gardens, the cemetery that I was talking to you about that was actually a collection of all the relocated cemeteries. Now, of course, it's much more than that. It's probably the biggest cemetery actually in the county right now, but behind me back this way, we're going to walk that way is the Blevins section. And there's little placards here that's kind of close to the ground that you would miss them if you wasn't looking for them but those are in honor of those cemeteries that were moved. As far as I know, every one of those has a little plaque that's on the ground here, the name of the cemetery that was moved. So again, the cemetery that the Blevins Cemetery was moved from, yeah, that location is underwater.
I know that there are probably more here, but for sure, I know that these were two that were moved. Noah Madison Blevins and Lydia Margaret, Margaret Blevins. And back there is a daughter. Over here would be another daughter. Right here would be a son. And back here, another daughter. Now, of course, their deaths occurred afterwards. And I'm sure there's more here. I just don't know on the Blevin side of things, but. This really is a pretty and a peaceful place up here. And, you know, like I mentioned before, there are a lot of other old family cemeteries that had the reinterment happen to this place. And why here's, you know, sometimes in my videos, I have a little twist at the end. Well, this is a twist at the end. How did I know and why did I know so much about this Blevins part of things? The two that I showed you were my great, great grandparents. So you're coming from a, uh, from a descendant of someone who was impacted. So yeah, it's a beautiful area up here. And this Blevins Cemetery, I was talking with someone in the family and they were telling me all about it. Cause I, I was, I really got on this, this subject of thinking about that eminent domain and whether or not you could move a cemetery, which, you know, the answer to that, it's going to be really wherever you're located at. And I'll tell you this, I don't know for sure that eminent domain was invoked and if it was in this case for Grayson Lake, they probably, I and mean, we're talking some, you know, some country people here, most of them from, from modest means, and they're not going to know what eminent domain is anyway, probably. So I don't know that those words were used, but I'm, I'm led to believe that when all this went down, it wasn't presented to them as if they had an option. I think it was presented to them as, hey, this is what's going to happen. Here are your options. So I don't want to make light of that. And here's why. I mean, you got, can you imagine someone coming to your house or your farm telling you, hey, this place that you've built up your whole life, now you got to leave, you know? But on the flip side, the lake is nice, you know? So I'm sure there's going to be people that fall if they, give an opinion in the comments that are going to fall on both sides of the issue. Myself, I'm not giving an opinion. I, I, you know, I see both sides of it. I'm going to say this. If I were living in those days when this happened and when they started knocking on doors, I probably wouldn't have been too happy just to be honest about it. Uh, hindsight, I mean, it's a nice place. And is it for the greater good? Probably. I mean, it, like I said, I've got a lot of fond memories up there with my grandfather and memories I wouldn't change. And, you know, I, I, I know, I know there's people that probably fell on both sides, but you know, we're talking now 50, 60 years in the past and, you know, you give it another 50 or 60, no one's really going to care. So thank you all for watching. And I hope you enjoyed this video on cemeteries and eminent domain and the building of Grayson Lake and how all that kind of intertwined together. Once again, from East Carter Memory Gardens here in Grayson, Kentucky, I will see you again soon.